if you're updating history or you know editing history mm -hmm. you're creating just one way to see the world yeah and, uh, and then again that's one way to see the world instead of many ways instead of this negotiation we've been talking mm -hmm. about and this moderation that yeah. we're talking about because who is so intelligent that they know exactly exactly how the world works i mean yeah it's just impossible no that and that's a sign of arrogance that's mm -hmm. a sign of arrogance to think that you that your point of view is correct. I hear a lot of people saying, oh, the left think that, and it's, it is a generalization. But I think within the arts, mm -hmm. left means more liberal. It's more about not having ideology predetermine what your artistic form is about or what you say. We studied how to actually write history itself, you know, how we can construct narratives. And that really made a difference to me because I finally thought about how I was saying stuff. I really began to think critically about how facts are presented. Hi, Ella. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. You too. Here we are in London. Been here for a day. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I guess you too, because you came from Cambridge, right? Yeah. Yeah. I met you um, through your boyfriend, David Cotter, who's been traveling with us and playing guitar at the beginning of each of our lectures. And uh, I met, I've probably met you three or four times now, huh? mm -hmm. but we talked early on about having a podcast. It took us a while to get together. So I'm really pleased that here we are sitting here today. Yeah. And that we can do it in person as well. It's and great. in person. Isn't that better? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Make a difference. It makes a big difference. It's fun. Either way, it's fun. I like Zoom. Zoom's all right. But there's something about being together that, well, it's just like, you know, communication with telephone rather than texting. There's a big difference between those things. Yeah, you feel a completely different level of communication, I think. Yeah, you know, you can say, uh, I'll be a little late by text. That works. Mm. But if you want to ask a question, if you want to have a conversation, you miss so much without being on the telephone. And I think it's a little bit like that. Uh, Zoom is, is pretty good because you have the visual as well. It's mm. pretty good. But in person, I think it's, well, it's always better. So I wanted to start with, uh, you wrote something about your degree and mm -hmm. finding your voice in the degree. You had a supervisor who spoke to you and said something like, uh, you said, my supervisor, my supervisor was referring to the socialization of girls towards obedience, a phenomenon that maps into primary and secondary school measures for success. And then you said, I finally understood why my peers were doing better than me, despite studying for far less time. So talk about that a little bit and what you learned. Yeah, so during school, I was always that student who revised, I'd say the most, I revised a ridiculous amount of hours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd, I'd sit there for hours and hours in my room, like writing down those facts and like putting it in my brain. And I think for secondary school and sixth form, that worked really well because I could memorize the facts mm -hmm. and put them down on the paper. But then when I, I then went to Cambridge, the University of Cambridge to study history. And I was here, you know, in this amazing place with a, a really intelligent cohort of students. And it was it was quite funny actually when I went to the interview because it was me and 15 boys. Because mm. um, I was the only girl that had applied to my college to study history. Um, so that was kind of a, a first like quite bizarre interview process, um, but it's fine. You know, I went to a a mixed state school, so that's not really ever been a problem or intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I got there and it was me and then other like five other guys got in, they were very kind of quite casual about studying. Um, or sometimes I would perhaps feel like uh, confused because I'd still be there, like, you know, do my many, many hours of studying. And I felt like, especially one student who's super intelligent and he was just so casual, you know, he's, I'd be there late into the night and he'd be like oh I've been playing on my xbox and be like oh that sounds so fun and you still do better at me in exams which mm -hmm. is great for him um he's a very good friend of mine but I was always a bit confused and then in the third year we studied how to actually write history itself you know how we can construct narratives and that really made a difference to me because I finally thought about how I was saying stuff and um I really began to think critically about how facts are presented because it's not enough just to recall facts. At, you know, for an undergraduate course, just recalling facts won't get you that far. Maybe it'll get you like a two-one. Mm -hmm. 
But to get a first, you have to think quite creatively and you have to think quite boldly. And finally, in third year, something was finally starting to click. So my director of studies kind of pointed out that I kind of finally got it. I could construct an argument creatively. And that was because I wasn't thinking so much about facts. He always used to say, facts, obviously you need to be accurate, but I'm not that impressed if you just give me the dates of when an event happened and mm. that's not enough. But I actually put pen to paper and just thought creatively and boldly. And only when I did that, did I actually finally, you know, get those those first marks. So you were asking questions to yourself? I was, and I think as well, I was, when I was asking questions, I was asking how certain historical events could map onto other events as well. So I was mm. thinking very laterally. And that comparison of two models mm -hmm. really changed how I thought. And it's very liberating as well. If you're going through life and you're thinking about, I don't know, the repeal of the Corn law Laws in the in the 19th century and that how, how that applies to economic policies today, mm -hmm. it's it's really creative and it, it really unearths different ways to see the world. Right. So, so taking the perspective, say, of the author and then looking at economics and how it compares to the history, it, uh, it gives you a, a, a place of comparison so then you can ask questions based on this point of view and that point of view. So it broadens out what you're... Yeah, that, that's very interesting. See, I've been going on this tour and I was talking about a rule a night, right? And then as the tour was going on, I'd think of this rule, but then I'd think, you know, that applies to this rule over here as well, and then bring that other rule in. And so then it would um, embellish the story and broaden the uh, the theme of, of the talk, you know? And so, yeah, having more points of view to draw from. Yeah, that's so, hmm. exactly right. And it, exactly how I feel quite energized sometimes when I collaborate with different people, because mm -hmm. that's another way of bringing two like models of right. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So it's a conversation that you're having with yourself rather than having between two people. And with people throughout history as well, which is just is fun. You know, if you choose people that you're interested in throughout history or artists, mm -hmm. you can have the most wonderful conversations and really sparky that you can bring to see. Right. Present. So, yeah, so you, you wrote an article on this... Uh, author Jed Pearl. Uh, he wrote a book. What was that book called? I don't have the name of the book here. I think it was um, Authority and Freedom, A Defense of the Arts. Yeah, that's right. And you wrote a review, Quillette, Quillette wrote a review, Franklin uh, Einspunch wrote a review, John Adams wrote a review. So people have been writing reviews of this book. Why are people responding to this book? Because I think Jed Pearl has approached the culture wars in a very, very clever way. Mm -hmm. I seem to remember he's quite like left leaning. Mm -hmm. But what I found with people in the arts who are like, you know, the arts is kind of skewed towards, you'd say like more left, like liberal people. Yes. Just the nature right. is very creative. Right. Um, but also he is using that lens to look at the culture wars. So it's a nice combination of the two because he's being quite critical of the culture wars and placing freedom of expression at the center because throughout history mm -hmm. freedom of expression has been you know the the reason for art to exist mm -hmm. it's like an expression of the inner individual but now we find ourselves in, at a time when sometimes artists are cancelled for what they believe or maybe the political people express their political views throughout their art and that idea that art is universal is completely you know um completely destroyed when you start to look at it through a quite ideological lens because you're just you're just saying one message, and if you disagree with that, then you you're not you're not looking at the art in the right way. So I think he kind of identified this phenomena in the arts, but he also wrote the book in a very artful way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I thought that was really clever because art is all about, about like bringing different perspectives to life, mm -hmm. and he managed to kind of unearth this perspective on the culture wars and the place of art in society today as an artistic product in itself. Right. So uh, looking at within within the modern times, I think this is what you're saying, within the modern times, and we have a, a culture war happening now where people are questioning from a political point of view, everything, whether it's political or not, they're politicizing everything. Mm -hmm. 
and art has been politicized as well. And so he's looking at it from a modern perspective, from from a, a perspective of when you say that he's looking at it from a left perspective, what do you mean that he's what what's that vision from the left perspective? Well, even though I say left, I do have have a problem when I use the term because I think it is completely like simplified as in like, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, the left think that and it's, it is a generalization. But I think within the arts, mm -hmm. left means more liberal and it's more about not having ideology um, predetermine what your artistic form is about or what you say. Um, so... I'm thinking about, I go to a, a lot of events for freedom of expression in the arts. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting. So I go to go, I also go to free speech events for other realms and free freedom of expression events in the arts industry always attract the most diverse crowd mm -hmm. because people bring it together because they have a real passion for the arts and they are practitioners and practitioners in themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think there have been lots of studies done about creative individuals are more likely to be like left leaning. Mm -hmm. If we if we define left leaning as like a set of values that can be identified, I think maybe like openness mm -hmm. um, and I guess creativity would really fall into that and determine that. Yes. Um, so it just brings together a whole different crowd of people into this into this conversation, coming at it from completely different perspectives. And that's when the critical thinking really gets done. Do you think that there's more people who will come who are advocates of free speech to those events? Yeah, because for them, free speech is the same as freedom of expression within their own artistic practice. Mm -hmm. And when you start to see it as that way, you really see the like the the universal power of freedom of of freedom of speech, mm -hmm. and how I think there's almost like a stereotype at the moment where free speech is equated to people who are like very like, you know, far right. It's just for racist people to give them a platform to speak. Right. And it's not like that. No. Freedom of expression is, you know, is represented by the arts and you just, they just conflict those identities. We went to a, um, a musical venue where David and uh, another uh, musician, Dimitri, this was in Sofia, Bulgaria, and they had a, a small uh, salon where they played music for us. And afterwards, I told you that I closed my eyes during the uh, musical performance, and I could see images. And they were they were not video. They, it wasn't a moving picture. It they were static. They were somewhat static images, although I would say they were alive, you know? And you thought that was interesting that, uh, say, the, the first, it was Mozart, Mozart pieces in the beginning, and I could uh, see that this was a, a, a natural landscape scene is what I saw, and uh, different movements were different kinds of landscape scenes, whether they were uh, more uh, winter scenes with harshness in it, or, or um, uh, forest, forest and flowing streams, and and you said, oh, that's interesting, and I thought uh, your comment that you thought it was interesting. I'd like to discuss that, like why you thought that was interesting, and how that plays into the other things that you're interested in in terms of art and the culture wars, and yeah, yeah well. It's such an immediate reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, when I listened to music as well, it was interesting when we compared our images actually because they were quite different. Um, and I think it really showed, it showed our own personal history. What was, do you remember what your images were? I think you were, when you were thinking about winter, for yes. particular piece, uh -huh. I was thinking of like a thread pulling, mm -hmm. um, a needle pulling a thread through some fabric, so the tension. Right. So I think... I guess winter could have expressed a tension mm -hmm. and like a tension that mine was expressing, but just in different ways. Yeah. And I just thought that was fascinating because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. music isn't representational. Um, but when you start to listen to music more and also look at images as well, if you compare the two together, like they're like metaphors to look at life. Mm -hmm. um, and metaphors are just, you know, we were talking about different models that you can bring together to look at things in a different way mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. Um when we're talking about when you collaborate, for example, mm -hmm. when you think of music, 
when you listen to music and you then an image comes to mind is almost like a metaphor for that music mm -hmm. so you're constantly making comparisons mm -hmm. and that brings out completely different sides of maybe your your personality or inner truth that you the way that you see the world and that to me is freedom of expression because it's not it's not filtered it wasn't political no there was no politics in it at all and it wasn't uh and it was a natural image that came to mind and it's very interesting, I thought, that there's no politics in it. There was no, um, there was nothing that was trying to judge. There was no judgment there. It was just a, an expression, a, uh, an image to uh, to bring to life the music in a visual manner was all it was. Mm. It, it makes it into almost like a total artwork, you know, you're, and then especially when we discussed it as well, we had the sound, we had the images, mm -hmm. then we also had the language when we discussed it between the two of us. Right, right. So through those three three different ways, we're seeing the same thing. And um, I think it's Heidegger who who talks about truth. You know, and Hegel as well, when they say, you know, you, you bring together two different models and you go towards a higher truth. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that there's just like one truth. It means that there is a truth that comes together, mm -hmm. but you come at it from different perspectives. So that to me is diversity of thought with an idea that you also have like a, almost like a hierarchy of values that people can see the same way. After yeah. all, we're all humans, right? Like we all we all feel like the same emotions of like joy and despair. So if you can compare those models together, you figure out, you compare how you see things with different people and that brings out diversity of thought mm -hmm. together in a very beautiful way. That made me think of uh, marriage, you know, when you have two people together and say you're, uh, you have a child and you need to discipline the child, you, if the two of you talk, then you come up with a combined philosophy of how to interact with, uh, say, a troublesome uh, behavior or something so you can negotiate and find a place of union between you that you both share that you both agree on so that when you interact with the world afterwards when you interact with the child it comes out as a, a reasonable and a fitting interaction rather than an overreaction mm -hmm. maybe if you had or if I had responded myself maybe my response would have been an overactive response but then I talk to you and I find out well that uh there's some more nuance to it. Yeah, so, you know, so going at something with a singular idea, power, mm. is going to make it very forceful, maybe more, or, or, or ineffectual. But if you can discuss it with other people, be open-minded to listen, mm. right, to listen, then you can update what it was that you were thinking and and uh, enrich it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and oh, that's very interesting. I, yeah, I think it really maps onto politics as well in terms of how a democracy works. Mm -hmm. Because often if you get quite a radical political party, you know, quite an extreme one, if it goes into government, so there are like theories. Um, there's a book called How Democracies Die. I can't remember the authors, but they discuss they discuss this idea in there mm -hmm. that if you have quite an extreme political party, and sometimes if they then go into government into an institution, they're forced to be moderate because they have to adapt to the other people who are also in that dem that democratic system mm -hmm. in order to be electable. Mm -hmm. So, it's you know discussions mm -hmm. about arts really kind of bring things in perspectives. It, it makes you very aware that there's other perspectives. It's not just you imposing your own vision of the world. Right. Um, it's very generous. Yeah, so in a democracy, as you said, when there's uh, two parties or more, so there's two parties, uh, if there's only one party, that's totalitarianism, right, where, where there's a dictatorship. But in democracy, if there's uh, two sides to the uh, parliament, then there's discussion, and that brings things into uh, har harmony at a more moderate place mm -hmm. yeah because often um authoritarian governments get in when 
say there's a very radical measure that's put through there's no one there to discuss the other side so people get yeah. one side of the story which is you know there's an emergency situation and that just creates a very simple a simple outcome um, but more extreme very yeah more mm -hmm. extreme and that's it's because mm -hmm. it's such a simple explanation because it's only you know one vision that's that's explaining explaining it mm -hmm. it's going to get past and that's that's really really difficult and that's a, a challenge i think for politics to come continuously prove the importance of democracy prove the importance of debasing these ideas in order to to almost moderate them yeah and update them for the times mm -hmm. and i think that's going to be a real challenge mm -hmm. that which art can really help us to appreciate yeah 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 that's very interesting democracy and art and how you can even compare the two mm, i want to talk about this book the story of art without men uh katie hessel wrote it. How long ago did she write it? Not very long ago. A couple of years ago? Yeah, it must be about two years ago. Yeah. And uh, one of the questions, was it a conscious decision to exclude women from art? That was one of her questions. And another question was, where was their platform that was on par with men? I thought those were both, uh, well, something that we could talk about. Was it a conscious decision to exclude women from art? What do you think of that? Well, I'm doing my PhD, studying for my PHD at the moment, and I study feminist art history. Okay. So I'm really interested in this issue. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of there's lots of theories towards this, you know, why are there no great women artists? Mm -hmm. But that question was asked almost as a, you know, ironically, it was like, yes. actually, there are great women. There stars. are, yeah. Obviously, anybody who has any, uh, any, interest in the arts would know of a couple anyway yeah yeah but it is it is um is a reality i guess that people can name many many more male artists than yeah. female artists today yeah. yeah and that's due to a variety of reasons and of course there's these issues where women weren't allowed to you know uh, train from the nude models mm -hmm. so that really kind of stepped them behind in art schools if they even got, were allowed into art schools in the first place, because mm -hmm. they're all male institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Royal Academy, for example, in, in England, when that was founded, there were two women who were in the original group, but they weren't, they didn't really play a major part. They were just there from the beginning as like a, a founding type member. And even when there were portraits drawn of this original committee, there were all the men in the room. And then the women were there as portraits on the wall. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that kind of fits in with a much wider status of women in society. Why, why, would, why would you think there would be only portraits of women? Can you think of why that might be? I, I'm trying to remember the exact like what the exact uh, pe image, mm -hmm. but maybe there were nude models in the in the image that were included. Maybe or busts of uh, of nude models. Um, Even busts of nude models would be a problem. They they were allowed to they were allowed to draw from busts. Okay, but I'm just wondering like whether they were how they were forging this image together, and they wanted to like really kind of maybe they were busy, maybe <laughs> and couldn't be there. Well, that's a big problem though. I mean, yeah, now for for working female artists, like we there is a problem if you're if you're self employed and your studio is your home, and you've had a child, you're busy. It's going to be difficult. Like you can't yeah. just uh, finish off a painting and have like a child next to you. Like to be really creative, for a lot of people, they have to have their own space. Yeah, and being an artist, unfortunately, is often not seen as a proper job. So, say if you've got a husband who is a, I don't know, he's working in a, a bank. Say it's a very gender split. I'm doing here, but mm -hmm. and you've got a woman who's a, a wife who's an artist. Who do you think is going to be told to give up their the work for a bit? Mm -hmm. It would make sense, right? If you've had a child, you've got your child at home. Your stu your, your studio is at home. It would make sense. Yeah. Well, when I had when I had children. Uh, when I was thinking of having children and I um, put it forward as that, that that's what I wanted to do, my husband said, well, I don't feel uh, financially secure enough yet to have children. But once he was secure enough and he thought about it, he thought, well, really, what it is is that I don't feel confident being with an infant. And so you want to have a, a baby. I don't know what to do with babies. So how about... I take care of you and you take care, care of the baby. And then we can then we can go forward with this. Otherwise, I don't feel confident about it. I thought that was very interesting that because I was very certain 
that I could handle the situation. I felt uh, no qualms about having an infant in my life, that that would be something that I, even though I didn't know or had never dealt with it, so I didn't really know what I was doing, I felt confident about it, whereas he didn't feel confident at all. And so that's the first thing, is that uh, a woman is more comfortable with the the infant, say, in the first three months of life than, than a man is. So a man really can't be expected to be thinking of putting that first because it just isn't natural. Mm-hmm. It isn't natural. But then again, once the baby is born, then that is your first uh, obligation. And it's just so obvious because they are completely uh, helpless that th- they're never wrong. They're always right. So whatever they need is first. Mm-hmm. And so if you're trying to do something that you're very interested in, say, express yourself through art, some creative expression, that's going to come second when your babies are, mm-hmm. are young. The trick is to find the space when your child grows to give them the freedom mm-hmm. and the autonomy so that you can do what you want. And that, I think, is very tricky for women to take back their time and to allow themselves to take back their time. And I don't think it has anything to do with uh, their husband Mm. uh, or the necessity of being a mother, but I think we have a tendency to give of ourselves as uh, as mothers. And, well, that's that conversation again between the husband and the wife is, how much time do I give to the child and, and how much of that time do I take for myself? Yeah, because I think throughout history we see that there's a stereotype of like the the suffering art genius male artist, right? And there's a reason for that is because you know if Gauguin wanted to go and live in Tahiti, he went off and lived in Tahiti. Yeah, and there were lots of if a woman was to do that to abandon her children, firstly there's lots of like societal like you know society punishes women more. You'd be seen as like really selfish, mm-hmm. and, you know you evil who what mother would abandon their child Mm -hmm. but throughout history like male artists have done that and it's almost like enhanced their artistic status and I don't think that's just society it kind of comes back from what what you were saying then it's like how society structures itself well and how now how naturally it the uh, fact of having a child what it does it changes us biologically you know um, a baby and a mother the baby, the baby's DNA goes into the mother and is active in the mother for a very long period of time. Mm. You know, so if, so if a mother is sick, the baby's DNA can be helpful. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Isn't it? It's, yeah. it's amazing. You know, we, we are so connected when we first have a, a baby. We are so connected that to take that connection and make it secondary is uh, is practically impossible, biologically. You know, I mean, you can uh, you can enforce your will to separate that, but it's not in. But it's not natural. No. It's not intended. It's not uh, at 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 our base understanding. Uh, we we are there to be together at the beginning. Otherwise, the baby uh, doesn't have as much chance of survival. Right, so, yeah. So, so that's that. That's the sacrifice of the mother, you know. The uh, the mother Mary with with uh, Christ draped after he's uh, been taken off the cross, mm-hmm. draped across her lap. That's the woman's sacrifice. Is that she has given herself to her children. And, and the thing about that is, is the time that you spend in that total sacrifice, I mean, you're a mother for your whole life, but full time, you know, mm-hmm. really, you know, a, a baby can nurse up to a year, but really full time nursing is only six months long. That's yeah. not very long at all. 
And so uh, thinking that women, part of the, part of the reason that women, are, I think, aren't in uh, as prominent a position as men is, first of all, they were having children mm -hmm. and they were having one after an, another. So they're having lots of children but also that women have a hard time separating themselves from their children. Yeah, and also especially in contemporary art as well. Like the mm -hmm. contemporary art world as like the art world also always has been very elite. It's mm -hmm. been very fashionable. So if you're going to an exhibition opening and you take a, a baby in a pram, yeah. it's not going to it's not very sexy in the art world <laughs> and it right, takes right, right. value because mm -hmm. you're supposed to be seen as the creative, the artist. Mm -hmm. So suddenly if you're seen as a mother, it almost devalues your work. Well, you know, a man isn't going to bring his uh, his typewriter or whatever it is to the art exhibit either. So, you know, you have to be able to uh, separate yourself from one obligation to another. Mm. And uh, you know, you could always bring you could always bring the baby in the pram and have a, a a nanny or an older child who's with the baby while while you're in the art exhibit. There's ways to do it, yeah, or you, your mother. Or, you have to admit, you know, yeah. problems. That's the, that's the thing which I find quite difficult because mm -hmm. I really want to help female artists and because I can see the problem, like, you know, like we were just discussing, but you have to actually identify that problem mm -hmm. to be able to improve the condition. So I think some galleries now have crashes. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's great because mm -hmm. that's obviously they've identified the problem and they want to try and solve it. Mm -hmm. And it's not the problem solved completely, but it's a, an admittance. It's an admi admittance of, you know, one aspect of reality. Oh, so is what? what is that that you mentioned, a crash? I don't know what that is. Like um, a, a place within the gallery to like hold your, uh, where people can look after your children. Oh, I see, yeah. yeah. Um, like a nursery. We yeah. call that a nursery, yeah. And, and that's why a lot of female artists throughout history have actually formed collectives as well. Mm -hmm. So they'd come together and maybe there'd be, a, you know, one artist who would look after the children for a while and that would allow all the other artists to like share a studio. Yeah. But just work. Yeah. It's um, a homeschool type of uh, arrangement. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's, it explains why, why these collectives have been so so popular with, within like women artists groups. Mm -hmm. But I think another thing that's been really interesting is the artist Artemisia Gentileschi, who was a Renaissance painter. Mm -hmm. And... She was an absolutely great artist, mm -hmm. and she portrayed, um, you know, the child with a uh, with Mary. And there's been analyses by art historians who compare it to like a same scene portrayed by her father, and they say you can tell it's hers because of the way that they're touching. Because mm -hmm. she say if you're a woman, you'd you'd feel the touch differently. Mm -hmm. So she portrays more of like a very like a, a sensitive touches the way they hold and like they're looking at each other mm -hmm. and it's it's quite an interesting way to analyze a, a painting but it was just reminded me of what you were saying before about how the how the baby is connected to the to the mother oh yeah connected in ways we can't even I, i'm sure we don't know all the ways yet but that was the one of the uh, more recent things that i learned was the that the dna is shared and uh that just blew me away i thought wow that's remarkable but mm. then when you think about it yeah you know what what would you do so that a baby could survive you would make the mother stronger so that she can survive yeah to take care of that child yeah and, and it's really interesting how certain paintings can reflect that connection because the painting summarize experiences of ways of feeling or seeing the world mm -hmm. and um, Mondrian I think was the person who said that a good painting is like the is striking the right balance between a subjective and objective way of looking at the world. Because what you describe there is like scientific, you know, you're talking about this DNA, mm -hmm. but how do you actually capture that in a way that we can feel it? Because mm -hmm. we, you know, we don't go through worlds thinking about like, oh, I felt the DNA connection there. You just feel a different, deeper connection. Mm -hmm. And art can really provide a pers another perspective to understand that in a very human, in a human way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, not having... This, this book, the story of art without men trying to see how, I mean, you know, I would think if I was going to write that book that I was seeing how women have done the work that they could do 
while also fulfilling their function as a, a wife and a mother. And I know that I've struggled with that. It, it's It's been difficult for me. Um, my daughter was ill. That meant that I gave up all, all the creative work I was doing when she was suffering. Because it must have affected you not just time-wise, but also in a very emotional way like it well it just seemed you know I went I was in uh, illustration so I was in the design side of the uh, art I, I went to an art college and I would have liked to go into the fine art side of it but I had young children so I wasn't going to be able to be in the studio whenever I wanted night and day so I decided that if I was working more uh, in design I would be able to manage that and so I went into design and I was doing very well I was enjoying my work and then I found out that my daughter was ill and I went and I spoke to the chairman of the department and I said to him uh, my daughter's been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and he said well I guess we won't be seeing you much anymore and uh, that was true mm -hmm. it was true because she was too sick for me to leave her yeah. And uh, when she became well again, then off I went. But when she was ill, it was difficult. And and uh, that complicated our relationship, which made it, I think, even a little bit more difficult for me to separate myself, to separate myself and to explore my creativity mm -hmm. and to put my obligations to the family aside. And you know, uh, as a father, Jordan was able to go upstairs into his office and close his door and say, "I'm I'm working," and not come. And he wouldn't come out till dinner time. And that was the that was the arrangement that we made, which was uh, it worked for him. Yeah, it's prag I like how it's very pragmatic. So yeah. David and I always discuss discuss these issues that, you know, when we're at home, sometimes people think, oh, you know, the stereotype is like the woman cooks, the woman cleans. But actually, if you're like, if you're in a supportive relationship, like I'd say, David does most of the cleaning and I really enjoy cooking. So we kind of negotiated it that way. Yeah, and, and Jordan used really to do, well. Jordan used to come down and cook. He liked to cook. He worked as a short order cook in a restaurant. Mm. So he, and he liked to have people come over. And if that was the case, I would usually start the dinner and then he would finish it mm. uh, so that I could get ready for dinner. So we we shared that uh, in terms of cleaning the house. I probably cleaned the house regularly and then every now and then he would do a deep cleaning of the house. Yeah, it's actually exactly for David. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's a negotiation, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think sometimes when people just say about like stereotypes and, you know, how terrible they are, like actually for me, like real feminism is being able to look very pragmatically at a situation and having choice mm -hmm. and being being comfortable enough to negotiate that with someone who understands you. Yeah. To admit, admitting what you need. Mm. Admitting that things aren't working out, that maybe you're putting too much time and not and don't have enough time of your own to talk about that and to have the um, to have the confidence, to have the confidence to have that conversation and to be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. Because so, often I think women will, not say anything and by the time we're in conversation we're already defensive because we've waited too long you know if you, i find if i can if i can uh, bring up my problem quick enough then i don't have any defenses and i can listen a lot more easily and uh, listening is when you can if you listen without defense so you're not trying to give your opinion or think up uh, what you like and dislike about it or you know so you're just listening you can update what it is that you came to the conversation with you can update 
and move forward with that with new information. Yeah. You know, it's... I, I really enjoyed when you were speaking about listening during the tour as well, it made me think so much about what actually listening is. And I think especially you're talking about listening to yourself. Mm. And um, again, I I'm always seem to be thinking about this in terms of art, but yes. as an artist, you are listening to yourself mm -hmm. and what you think and figuring out a way to express that in mm -hmm. the way that other people will... And, will understand or not even for other people but just so how you understand mm -hmm. um and i think in a in a relationship again it's this kind of self-reflection listening to the other person bringing together those two models of seeing the world and finding a way to like move forward in the most in the most enjoyable way yes right and that's really beautiful yeah well the and I, the idea of the enjoyable way means that you've listened and uh you've listened to each other enough that you feel this new uh, playfulness and joy that you can take out into the world. And you, and you understand too that if you're not listening, then at the end of the conversation, there's still frustration. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't that uh, feeling of, of joy and, and newness, of uh, new, new breath to, you know, a, a new air to breathe mm -hmm. at the end because you've um, you've learned something that uh, lightens your load. Mm. Yeah, and that's what you want. Yeah, and I think um, I was just thinking of, you know, like like you did <laughs> just arrived back from, from Canada, so feeling very tired, and, you know, David was feeling really tired, and I've been really tired, so listening almost breaks down, like, you know, the two people are tired. Mm -hmm. So when David arrived back, he was really tired, I was really tired, and you can't put the effort into listening enough to each other. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, when misunderstandings happen and it's harder to be as as productive, things become quite destructive, Yeah. if not. So it's about catching yourself and ha putting in the energy to mm -hmm. listen. Yeah, and if you don't have the energy, then it's time for a nap. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. right, and maybe for both of you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. Because it's very, it's this whole negotiation idea of being married and, having children and how to negotiate that and having, have, having the chance to find your own time so that you can do your work. You know, that that's key mm. to having a successful marriage. So you wrote about Sir Stanley's painting, Free Love Among the Nations yeah. from 1935. And this painting was taken down from the Fitzwilliam mm -hmm. Museum Cambridge. in Cambridge. How did this happen? Well, what happened was that following Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. the Fitzwilliam Museum looked at its collection, you know, to, to highlight and reevaluate how it was writing labels mm -hmm. as many, many oh, I see. did. Right. Um, so they'd be highlighting aspects of the, the paintings, which, you know, needed needed to be flagged up. Mm -hmm. well you know needed to be mm -hmm. flagged up mm -hmm. um so sir stanley spencer's painting is um I, what was the title again sorry i don't want to it's it. called uh free love among the nations free love along the nations and mm -hmm. you portray people from all different kind of ethnicities like you know in in love i guess as a crowd together mm -hmm. but these were seem to be very stereotyped images so the fitzwilliam museum wrote a new label that highlighted how this was you know terrible um and you know how it relates to black lives matter i can't remember the exact label but it was along those themes i wonder if um, i wrote it down i might have written it down just a sec no i don't think i did write it down uh, well it was it was kind of along those themes i think it's still it's still available online um but they did that and i think people were a bit you know people felt a bit uncomfortable because it's a public art art gallery yes it's and, from 1935 this painting yeah yeah and then suddenly the painting got removed, mm -hmm. but nothing was said about it. So my big problem for this for this issue, mm -hmm. like the one that I was thinking about the most, was mm -hmm. the fact that it's a public museum mm -hmm. and there's almost like a lack of accountability. Because if you have a painting within a permanent collection that belongs to the public, mm -hmm. for it to have been, I think oh, it, was, yes. it was on display for many, many decades. Mm -hmm. It's like, it came with, um, it's usually displayed above another painting by Stanley Spencer. So they're like kind of one below, one above. Mm -hmm. And the the love among among the nations was removed, so it was just now there's literally an empty space where it was, mm -hmm. and there was no kind of a public discussion of it. So I think I think it was a, the Telegraph who reported this and they brought it to light. Mm -hmm. But it's just interesting how things can kind of get swept under the carpet, 
and even now it's not there. Well, these are these are curators that are making yeah. these decisions. But curators I, of the museum, yes. Yeah, but I I have a lot of sympathy for curators. I mean, mm -hmm. I I work with a lot, and they they have the you know the best the best of intentions, and mm -hmm. I think is really difficult as a curator. You've got your funding sources, which are very difficult to get. Mm -hmm. And these are these funding sources are often administered to, by very certain rules. Mm -hmm. If you're having people on social media flagging up how this painting is racist, mm -hmm. firstly, these jobs in galleries are really hard to come by. You've studied for many years, you know, masters, PhD, whatever. And even then they're really competitive and also really low wages as well. Mm -hmm. And then if people on social media are highlighting the the, the you know problems in your collection, mm -hmm. you probably feel really vulnerable. And I'm not saying it's right that they should have done it, mm -hmm. but I just think the whole... Um, you could see how it happened. I can see how it happens. And I think we need to discuss that. I yeah. think it's really important because it's almost like an anxiety. And to me, the mm -hmm. worst thing is when paintings get taken down without explanation or even sometimes with explanation. I think in Manchester Art Gallery for one exhibition, mm -hmm. A painting of a, a group of nude of nude women got taken down in light of the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. It was staged as like a a performance, an intervention for an for an artist exhibition, mm -hmm. but it caused such outrage that you know with a, with a public of Manchester who loved this painting as part of the permanent collection, one of the key ones that people go to visit this gallery, mm -hmm. that the council actually re requested that it was returned. Mm -hmm. So it actually returned to the walls. Mm -hmm. But what was fascinating about that was that it all played out in like the in the media. So you knew exactly what was happening, who did it, why the decision was taken, mm -hmm. and then also why the decision was like, was reneged and it went back. Mm -hmm. And there was even a messaging board online where members of the public could, you know, write in and say, oh, well, I agree that it was taken down because da da da, mm -hmm. or this is an outrage, you know, it's my favorite. I traveled really far to visit this gallery and it wasn't on the wall. But that was taken down on the message board, the message board. And about three years ago, I was studying this message board mm -hmm. and using the comments. And then suddenly it was taken down. And I think I get that web maybe websites need to take down information because of maybe it just gets too much on, on a certain website. But to me, that was a really interesting instance of how a public gallery should work. If we're going to reflect the wishes of the public yeah. and not just ideologies, which are might might not reflect what people who are visiting the gallery actually want, mm -hmm. I think I think there's a real lost opportunity there, and it's a shame to me that it's gone. And I'd love for it to return. Yeah. Why do you think it was taken down? I don't. I don't really want to speculate. I don't, I don't really want to speculate because mm -hmm. you know these could just be, like I said, maybe they just want to strip down the information on the website. Right. 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 Um, but I think. I think it's a really good source to think about how galleries are public right. and what a public museum or gallery is today. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think um, you know, although these are creative works and so they are an individual's um, interpretation of a historical time and what was going on at that time, uh, it, it gives us uh, a glimpse, a glimpse into how things were. Mm. And do we not want to know how things were? You know, or do we just want a blank slate of our past? You know, how are we going to, just in our day-to-day -day life, we when we talk to people in our families, we refer to, you know, to uh, other instances of things happening in order to build a case for whatever it is that you're trying to talk about. You can't just decide that you want to not have anything from the past move forward because you can't learn that way. You know, that's one of the things I think we don't live for very long. We live for, you know, 80 years and uh, maybe we've made a lot of progress in our 80 years and we've written a book. So there's some indication of what we thought, but we die, and the people that come up again, if they don't read those books, then they, they start over again. Mm. And so it's really hard to make progress if we don't discuss. Yeah, and it's the idea of models as well. Like if mm -hmm. you just, if you're updating history or, you know, editing history, mm -hmm. you're creating just one way to see the world. Yeah, and, and uh, then again, that's one way to see the world instead of many ways, instead of this negotiation we've been talking mm -hmm. about and this moderation 
that we're talking about. Because who is so intelligent that they know exactly exactly how the world works? I mean, yeah. it's just impossible. No, that, and that's a sign of arrogance. That's mm. a sign of arrogance to think that you, that your point of view is correct, mm. without any discussion. Yeah, because yeah. I, I think about this a lot for in terms of literature as well. Mm -hmm. I'm actually delivering a speech soon about sensitivity readers and okay. updating oh, old, yeah. old books. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm. And. I think that's because there was a, a big issue in the press about the Roald Dahl yes. books being edited by Puffin Books. Yeah. And the more I think about that, the more I think it was a marketing technique by them. Oh, absolutely. Oh, do you think so? Yeah. Oh, really? Ah. Um, because the changes were so drastic. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, Roald Dahl's popularity <laughs> increased so much because, you know, people <laughs> yeah. wanted to buy the old books. Um, and they were actually not edited in the end. So No, they weren't. No. Yeah. And so it worked. It worked for them. It worked. They benefited. From oh, that's it. interesting. Um, I wonder if that's true. Again, yeah. maybe that's just speculation. But it, I think people benefited from that whole thing. Uh, uh, um, yeah, marketing. Uh, it's a it's a sly it's a sly uh, endeavor that marketing. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I actually I've been thinking a lot about sensitivity readers themselves mm -hmm. because I always try to read the other side of the argument or what I you know what I assume for me to think. I always try to first well probably second actually then try and seek the other side mm -hmm. as you would usually think you would in academia right you tried to figure out the disagreeing side mm -hmm. although that's more increasingly lost in some some subject areas mm -hmm. but i find that really interesting to almost convince myself of why we need sensitivity to readers or why we need to update old books because then you're understanding and sharpening your own arguments to the side and maybe your your view is, is changed and when I was learning about sensitivity readers, I learned that an author, so say if yourself was like writing a book and you were talking about an experience that was completely not yours. So right. say if you were talking about someone who lived in, I don't know, um, Thailand, mm -hmm. um, and you have no idea how that, that, you know, someone in Thailand growing up would live, you might actually employ someone who was in that position to say, actually, what you've said there isn't accurate. Well, that would be an editor who was editing the book when you first published it, though. Yeah. So sensitivity readers is actually uh, really an editor or a researcher. Yes. Mm -hmm. And actually, you don't need to take that feedback on board. So as a as an active or, um, author who's alive, mm -hmm. you can say, I'll take that suggestion, but I'm going to reject that suggestion. Mm -hmm you're just basically commissioning someone to do your own research for you. Mm -hmm. So that to me is quite clever, right? You're going to make yourself more credible as an author because you're going to avoid maybe some very glaring mistakes. Right, right. Maybe you're saying... But you would do that if you were, say, writing a new uh, edition. Yeah. Right? But not. Mm -hmm. on, but the problem is, is when you have like an author who's dead because obviously yeah. you can't reject the changes that have been made. Right. And that's when history is falsified or... Yeah. And that's that's the real danger for me. But I think yeah. the term sensitivity readers is sometimes misapplied because mm -hmm. even myself, when I was first coming to the issue, I was saying, oh, sensitivity readers, how terrible. But sensitivity readers implies quite like a moral like label. Mm -hmm. And actually there's other, I can't remember the other word for it, but if we were to just say it in terms of like a researcher, mm -hmm. then it would almost make the division. Or an there. editor. An ed yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't even know why they have changed the term actually. No, it, I think maybe it was in the press. Maybe it was like just created into a bigger story. Yeah. But it is really important to distinguish the two because updating old books is really different because mm -hmm. you're taking that author's got no agency, you know, he, yeah. they can't reject. Yeah, that's right. No, I, I, I don't agree with that at all. But if if someone is going to write a, a new edition or there's new uh, information that's come to light that can update something, then... Uh, you can take that into consideration. Yeah. I can't see really that being harmful as long as the person who's the author has a, a say in it. The the only the ways that I do see it harmful though mm -hmm. is if the publisher commissions yeah. someone and then say they say that part in your book is is racist. And like, again, that's that's a a totalitarian way of saying it because it's only their point of view yeah. without discussion. But you can see how the publisher, if you then said, actually, I don't want to take on that suggestion, your publisher would yeah. be a bit like, well, we can't actually publish this if it's, you know, racist. So you can see how there's miscommunication there. And I think that's the problem that I see for sensitivity readers. If they impose quite like a, you know, moral readings, and then who is a published, like the publisher will then take their moral reading on board. Yeah. And that, that creates quite a lot of conflicts. Yeah. Well, and you know, you got to, 
the whole idea of uh, freedom of expression mm. is to be able to have someone write a book. And uh, of course, now there's self-publishing. Mm. So then there's going to be more. It, it's more an artistic endeavor then than it used to be because then there isn't necessarily a publisher who's putting their stamp on it. Mm. And um, perhaps that's maybe that's how that's come about is, I, I'm not sure, but if there's self-published books, then people are reading those books and thinking, oh, actually, that's not, uh, that did, the research that's done there wasn't complete. It would still, you know, the, the right thing to do is to discuss it with the author. Yeah, it's motivation as an author and the same as, like a, I guess, like a PhD researcher. If you are responsible for your book, you want to make it as credible as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's it's this idea that we sh there are certain like truths, you know, if maybe a certain, I don't know, McDonald's meal is not sold in one country, but you say that it is in your book. Yeah. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. So you as a researcher needs to be responsible because if people say that's false and you've lost your credibility as an author and it almost highlights the importance of people taking responsibility for their own research, trying to figure out the facts when there are facts mm -hmm. and and reflecting that and making making the professor profession a profession again well they could also write their own book too mm. with an update as well so there's different ways to do this rather than changing the books that have already been written yeah yeah right yeah yeah so there's definitely has to be con conversation about these things mm. and decide what the right way to do it and Maybe every situation needs a discussion. Yeah, I'd certainly agree. And that's why I've been so interested in the power of free speech, because you can draw out all these different perspectives. Yes. And um, again, like we were saying, figure out your perspective is likely not going to be the answer to everything. Yeah. Well, in fact, it's certainly not going to be the answer to everything. No, it's certainly not. And hardly anything, mm. right, is, is what you find out. Yeah. Hardly anything, because everybody's got a point of view and... If you take that into consideration, it definitely updates what you're thinking about. Mm. So then there was another thing, uh, article that you wrote. I've been busy recently. <laughs> the Romantic Resurrection. Yeah. I don't know how long ago you wrote that. I didn't put down the date. I think it was just a, a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, so fairly okay. Recent. So this is what so this is what I wrote down from that um, writing in 1750, Rousseau predicted that the arts and sciences would eventually become so disconnected from the world that mankind would have to beg God to return to us our ignorance, innocence, and poverty, the only goods that can make for our happiness and that are precious in your sight. The Oh, this was about chat GBT. Mm -hmm. The interchangeability between Tate chat GBT proposal and the Welcome Trust exhibition reflects this artistic dystopia. So you were looking at chat, GPT, mm. and and art. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about that. Okay, so a lot of arts nowadays, and there's great contemporary artists, so I really want to emphasize that because I think it's really important that we don't lose faith in contemporary art. Yeah. But a lot of contemporary artists start with a theory, and mm -hmm. it's very much mediated through like language. So a bit like we were talking, bef talking about before, when we listen to music, we are... It comes from within ourselves, the vision, like mm -hmm. the reaction. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to start of a theory and whatever that theory might be, maybe it's postmodern, like a likely going to be postmodernist inspired mm -hmm. theory. It's very much located in the language. And mm -hmm. now language doesn't come from within. I guess poetry gets a bit closer to this because poetry is more metaphorical and more of a form. Mm -hmm. But you don't look at something and analyze it in terms of this very disconnected postmodern theory. Yes. Um, you you feel it first and that's what makes us human we are we react to things we feel emotions so i was finding with a lot of arts you almost to understand some some contemporary artists you have to study the theory and read this label read it quite a few times and you might still not understand it before you can actually appreciate the artwork and um this is called like i mean the term for it is is art bollocks actually mm -hmm. um because how many people can have has the time have the time to fully appreciate a work of art if they have to learn these very complicated theories with terms which are very difficult to get to grips with. Um, so there's just seemed this very big disconnect for me between some contemporary artists 
producing art which was almost quite elite you had to be quite like versed in these postmodern theories to understand what the artist wanted to say and this type of art really reflects very well to chat gpt interestingly because it's located in words it's not how we experience the words the, the world mm. it's just a, the written word as language so i kind of map these together and the similarity between a certain exhibition at the Wellcome Trust about milk, which asked, is milk is milk political? Right. Compared to like the exhibition description that Chat GPT generated for the Tate Modern was really interesting for me. And it just really showed like a almost like a lack of human creativity because they're not the questions that people are asking. I mean, who has a glass of milk and looks at it and actually thinks, oh, it's, is milk political? <laughs> it's not how we experience milk. We taste milk. We, you know, it's we see it we're not asking this question first and foremost. So I think it shows that the priorities in the art world have gone wrong in some areas. And Chap GPT and its, um, its ease to replicate these ways of looking at art and producing art shows that we need to now move on and assert our humanity and how we experience the world in a very human way. Do you think that Chat GPT is... Um... I know that... It was programmed in a way that was somewhat woke. And so you have to sometimes confront it, mm. confront it and, and ask it not to um, moralize and to um, tell you what to do because it sometimes has opinions mm. that, uh, you know, if you, if you ask it for a reference for a book, sometimes it'll give you references that don't exist. So you have to tell it, ask it if it's telling the truth. You know, it's very, very an interesting like thing. Like a that, child. <laughs> yeah, like a child. Like uh, a PhD eight-year-old, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because it's uh, it does things that are immature. Mm. It has an immaturity about it. And uh, I wonder if that has anything to do with if ChatGBT is, is producing a piece of art. Do you find that it's... Uh, uh, a piece of art that has a postmodern uh, basis to the art, or does sometimes it, does it actually produce art that is more um, subjective? Well, I think Chat GPT is is inaccountable. Like, you know, it's not. It hasn't got a con. Like, I know there's lots of debates about this, but if you were to say something that was false your reputation would likely to go down within that circle of people that you said it to because mm -hmm. they'd be like, why she just lied, mm -hmm. you know? But chat GPT doesn't have that responsibility. If it tells a, a, like a lie, mm -hmm. it doesn't care. Right. Because um, it's not it's not thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And I think there should be a responsibility for artists to tell the truths that they see. Mm -hmm. They have a responsibility. If it's going to be in a public art gallery or funded with public money... I think they need to pursue their own vision, but also like have it coming from within. Because I, I honestly think that you know, as humans, we're all, all of us share like the same, many, like the same common attributes in terms of like a universal humanity. Mm -hmm. And if people are true to that, then their expression can come out in many different ways. But it's not going to be the theory first. And um, mm -hmm. the images that 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 AI produce, well. Firstly, they're not that interesting because they're not about humans. Like we're interested throughout our art history, we're always interested in the artists themselves. We can't get away from that. Like mm -hmm. we're interested in all the affairs that Picasso had. We think, you know, that was so terrible of him, but it's also what makes him quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're saying that's good behavior. We're saying that's part of his personality or his life, mm -hmm. which makes him interesting as a figure throughout history. Mm -hmm. um, and as humans, we're very social beings. We, I always think about like, so pop for us you know like uh, in England mm. we have like EastEnders and mm -hmm. they're very interesting because it's basically watching gossip each night mm -hmm. on the TV mm -hmm. and I think we need to relate to art and artists in that way mm. and that's not to completely argue for a reading of arts just based on like the artist biography so just interest in the artist's lives and that's it mm -hmm. but it's a mix of the two you know like mm -hmm. how these lives have been shaped by the context and how yeah. they influence how they think and I think fundamentally AI generated technology, like generated images, cannot reproduce these human lives. Mm. 
because they're not human. Yeah. And there is there are arguments which I get that AI can just be another tool in the artist toolkit. You know, like maybe you would do most of the design, but then you would just say to AI, generate me a chair for that corner. And yeah. then so it would just be one aspect of the canvas. Mm -hmm. And that is is true. Like that's mostly the artist expression. But there surely comes a point where there's like a threshold that's reached, you know, between we know there's a line, there's an implicit line almost that we know that humans mostly produce the artwork versus that's an AI generated image. Right. So I think at the moment we're really trying to figure out our feet, especially in terms of copyright laws as well. It's, mm -hmm. a, big, it's a big issue for the law at the moment and art because we don't know how to incorporate these, these images into art history. But there seems to me, after thinking about it a lot and studying the, a lot of different artistic movements, that I'm very hopeful that AI-generated images will not replace artists. And if anything, it's going to be a call for artists to up their game almost mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and try and make art that reflects their humanity and a common humanity as well, rather than one based on, a, you know, postmodern division. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm hopeful that uh, ChatGBT, when it gets its when it's not only text, but also image and those interact, that it'll take its information from the world mm -hmm. and then it will be less likely to be theory-based yeah. in any way because it'll be taking uh, taking its information from the real world. So we're hopeful that, that, that that's what will happen. Mm because it's really in its infancy right now. It's yeah. just beginning. Yeah. And it can generate really dark images at the moment. I don't know if you've seen any of these online, but the images that people produce of AI are really dark. It'd be like, you know, a scene where there's loads of like dead babies. Like oh, is that right? It's like horrific dark images. Mm. So that's, you know, it's it's difficult, difficult to consider. I am, I am hopeful that AI we'll figure it's, you know, we'll figure out how to use AI. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember, like, I actually started the article talking about photography and how when photography was introduced, everyone yes. was like, really scared. And um, Yes, that's true. It's a study of history which really brings perspective, I think, to these things. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it's just a human nature to be scared of things that are new. Yes. But it will, I am hopeful that it will settle itself out. And as you say, if it was, if it was to, like, almost learn a different type, like, well, actual humanity. Mm -hmm. And the the goodness of humanity rather than just it's dark very exaggerated dark elements yeah then that would be a really a really bright future i think i think that's interesting that it's showing dead babies because we are having a conversation about abortion mm. in our society and the uh and how to go about birth control mm. i did a podcast on uh, the birth control pill that is it was based on a, a book that was just written about yeah. your brain on the birth control pill. No, it's uh, Dr. Sarah Hill. Her name is Dr. Sarah Hill. Okay. She wrote a book called Your Brain on the Birth Control Pill. And it's uh, it goes into what I wanted to talk about for years about the pill because I found it was very difficult for me to take it. And I imagined it was very difficult for other women now. And I've had many, many, many comments on that podcast about how much trouble people have had with it mm -hmm. that we haven't, and we haven't talked about that very much at all. No, I've, I had a conversation about this, like a, quite a lot of them actually recently. Mm -hmm. um, I'm starting a group at the moment about for, for women interested to like discuss these issues. Oh, I see. And it's really interesting because a, lo a lot of us come have different opinions. Oh, you'll have to read this book. I will. Mm -hmm. Um, because I've I've always been a bit more, you know, reticent towards birth control pill. Like mm -hmm. you know, like you said, many horror stories, and everyone that I talk to seems to say, "Oh yeah, I was I had that side effect." And yes, I felt that sure. way. Mm -hmm. And you know, including myself. And when you actually experience that that in yourself, then you realize you're like, "No, that is true." Like you know, that was me experiencing that. Um, but then I also talked to someone else who was a much more pro the pill because. And her opinion was really interesting and changed what I thought in a way, enhanced my perspective. It didn't change my mind, but enhanced what I was thinking. Because mm -hmm. she said, you know, in the 1960s when it was introduced, it was so, it was like a revolution, right? Like women could have mm -hmm. a lot more freedom. Mm -hmm. And we've almost got used to that freedom that we've got now, mm -hmm. that perhaps we don't know how good we've got it. So it's almost, basically her, you know, 
I I just take it for granted that I can have a boyfriend mm-hmm. and also do my PhD and you know just like live my life as I do now. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a society, we've got used to that, mm-hmm. but we've almost I think my generation we've never known any different. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's good it's good to study the other side as well. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't ha- I didn't I I was born in the early sixties. So the birth control pill was uh, available to me, mm-hmm. um, but I found for the birth control pill was uh, it gave me it gave me too much freedom, mm-hmm. and because I didn't have a lot of conversations about whether I should use it or not, and when I should use it, and for how long I should use it. Didn't have any of those conversations. Mm. And you need to have all those conversations. And the one thing that uh, I would just caution people about in in terms of the pill is uh, you should make sure that young women who decide to take it, to have a discussion with someone that they can confide in, Mm to keep an eye on them for the first number of months to see, because it's hard, you know, if your mood changes, it's hard to tell yourself Mm -hmm. that your mood has changed. You have to have other people who are monitoring you. And if you've hidden the fact that you've gone on the birth control pill and haven't told anybody, nobody will know why your mood has changed. So it's really important that you share that information with someone that you trust mm. and 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 monitor you know maybe, maybe even have a a log that you keep about how you feel how you're sleeping um how your mood is when you wake up what kind of things you're doing uh in your life if you've stopped doing those things mm-hmm. uh if you're taking care of yourself if you're getting your hair cut and if you're dressing nicely how your relationships are with your friends. I mean, there's lots of things Mm -hmm. that you can put down to have an insight into whether this pill is working for you or not. Yeah. I think that's why apps like um, Flow, for example, you can can log your mood because... Yeah, it's really important. Yeah, because you can get those trends in over over a long time because there are quite dramatic stories of the pill and I've heard so many stories. Like, you know, it's like the more you talk about it, I could give you like loads of stories of friends who've had terrible experiences and yeah. even myself yeah but like you said you almost get used to your used to your you don't used to your mood you you mm-hmm. don't realize your personality changes no and I think sometimes as well it's hard to know I guess as a as a woman like if you think oh, I've had a down day you often just like say oh it's my right. hormones right but it's actually hard to know like I think sometimes my my mood might be down for other reasons, but then mm-hmm. I blame it on that because it just seems to be the easiest explanation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it is really hard to to know, and I think that's why, especially for my generation, who were afraid. I think a lot of people are afraid to talk about these issues, mm. um, to actually just talk about them and come together and just share stories. Because the more knowledge, the more power. Right, you've got the more choice. Yeah, yeah. And often when you come together and you hear more people than not saying about the horror stories. Yeah. It starts to create an impression. Yeah. Well, I think that for myself, it was when I talked to someone. Mm-hmm. It was when I talked to someone that I decided not to take it anymore because she had similar side effects that I did. And I thought, oh, okay, so this is definitely the pill that's mm-hmm. causing these troubles. Yeah. Well, what what it was for me is that when I went to the doctor, I said, hey, once a month I get like a, a blind spot in my in my vision, like you know, oh there dear. I can see like a ring. And they were like, oh yeah, it's just the pill. We'll just switch you to another one. Oh, <laughs> so, like, so I was like, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a, apparently a very bad thing to have. But it was just so kind of blasé. It was like, oh, it's fine. It just means that we it's now time to move you on to a different type of pill. Yeah, and I also heard, and I don't know if this is the case. My grandchildren are still very young, so I haven't had kids for a while uh, around that are of, of the age that you would take the birth control pill, but that they're giving girls birth control pills as soon as they start to have their period. Wow. So you never really figure out what your body is then? Mm-mm, mm-mm. I think that girls should be taught the rhythm method. Mm. They should be taught what it, what their monthly cycle is and how to understand 
when they're fertile and when they're not. And they should know all of that. Mm. They should know all of that in a very a detailed manner about their own uh, cycles. Mm. And that that's a, that's a tool. That's a tool that they can use. Yeah. And then they wouldn't have to go on a birth control pill. Yeah. And it's that whole thing about being in touch with I guess reality, right? Like we were talking yeah. about through art and everything. It's like the the acknowledgement that you are not so mighty that you can take away a big aspect of your being. Yeah, that just doesn't work. No, um, and the power is in those who understand who understand their bodies as as they are. Um, yeah, I think that's so scary that they're giving the pill to, to children so young. I just find it so weird. You never experience what it is to to almost grow up. I guess. Like, yeah. Well, the thing is, well, not only that. I wonder, you know, with this uh, trans. Um, ideology that we're going through right now and the ease at which they're giving hormones to kids and I wonder whether if we had had this conversation about hormones when women started taking the birth control pill if we would have a different point of view now with giving people hormones again and we're still not having this we're still not having these conversations I mean we're beginning to now because detrans- detransitioners are starting to speak out. We're having those conversations now about how um, permanent changes that happen. Mm. And there are permanent changes that happen with the birth control pill too. So, But we, you got to read that book and, and, and uh, that'd be a good thing to have a chat about in your group. Yeah, yeah, for certain. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm very excited about the discussions that we're going to have because... Like I said, it's it's hard sometimes in certain groups to actually say, oh, actually, I don't think that's such a good thing. Um, and I'm really hoping in this group we'll have people who are very for the pill, for example, and also yeah, you well, know, it's, it's just create these kind of sparky conversations of different perspectives. Yeah, well, Dr. Sarah Hill, she's not against the pill, no. but she wants everybody to be conscious of what they're doing and that there are different pills that you can take mm-hmm. and just to be sure that it's not causing you uh, negative negative symptoms, you know, mm. to be very careful with it, to be very careful with it, mm. I think is really what you're seeing. Be very careful. And I agree, be very careful. Mm. That's what I took away from it. I just get so many comments of people who've had uh, blood clots and, I mean, very major, major problems. Yeah. So... Just, just back to that issue, but in terms of one thing about with art at the moment, mm-hmm. I think there's a real difference between like fast solutions and slow thinking. Right. And I think to me, the pill is like a very much like a very fast. simple, mm-hmm. fast solution. Mm-hmm. But art can actually teach us to look at things very slowly because, you know, the, the skill of a painter, you have to go to art school, you have to learn your craft and then you can break the rules later on. Mm-hmm. But it's a really patient process. And when you're face to face with a, with a painting, you're in a very sacred space. Almost, if you go to a gallery, you, you've done the, you know, you've had to make the journey, you've had to go and get the ticket, and like walk up to the painting. And you have a very, very like one on one encounter, where you have to think about it, and then maybe you come back, and that encourages a very slow type of thinking. But I think at the moment I'm seeing on many many issues this idea of very fast consumption, fast mm. solutions. You know, anyone could be an an artist. Anything is art, mm-hmm. versus a bit more of an appreciation for like understanding and taking the time to learn the different perspectives and really craft your own thinking. Well, this idea of having to learn how to paint an oil painting, that it that there is there are different schools of thought that you can learn all these different ways of painting and then you can go outside the box after that Mm. but thinking that you can go outside the box before you have any expertise uh, is um, it's too soon Mm. it's too soon and that will make it uh, less deep and less uh, it'll it'll take you it won't be as profound an experience you know because you haven't given the time and the experience to 
to to use it in a way that will allow for uh, a real change in perspective. Because you, you may just, if you're not trained, then you're going to be making, you're going to be making changes that are mm, not informed, right? So then it might be, you know, when you, um, uh, when you see images sometimes of uh, surrealism, the twistedness mm. that comes out of that, I think that if you're not careful and take the time, that your perceptions and your ideas then can, they can, they can twist rather than be informed and changed. Yeah, you don't have your language like you. Yeah. you don't have your own language to express how you see the world mm -hmm. because as individual humans we all see the world differently and we're talking about again before we listen to the music we we had different visions yes and that's an inner difference which is a different a perspective you can bring onto the world but you can't just express that perspective because it's not easy to express mm -hmm. it's very however you do it whether it's through language or music it's going to be incomplete because you can't express the human the human mind but the more you study ways to express yourself and the more you experiment with it get it wrong have it on the wall for a while and then realize you're not so happy with that bit, you'll find that a style develops which is distinctly your own. Mm -hmm. So I, like my, well, one of my favorite artists is Ellis Lowry, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, he studied at art school, although not many people know that, but because he, he then developed this quite like almost, people describe it as naive, but my big argument is that, you know, it's, and as, if, as other people have argued as well since, I mean, before me, but I've then kind of used it and taken new direction, um, that, this wasn't a naive style, but it was informed by his study. Mm. So he had to, then he could break the rules. I looked at I looked at his work. Yeah, yeah. So like at the at the start, many people just see matchstick men, matchstick cats and dogs, and it was actually a like a a chart topping hit that was like use those lyrics about him. It was a mm. very popular conception. But actually, when you start to look at the individuals, you see it's the same style, but it's not the same style as you thought it was going to be. It's not matchstick men and matchstick dogs, but it's actually a really delicate language based on a very sad aspect of his own human of his own um, life actually as an artist and how he really struggled with different roles he had to play like the bread he had to um be a breadwinner like in terms of looking after his mother who criticizes mm -hmm. art he, you know he was really she was really harsh to him he'd say it was just a hobby and that no one took him seriously but he was actually a very accomplished artist and he was a mem became a member of the royal academy in the end mm -hmm but he was also from North England, from near to Manchester. Um, and he was having to go to like the London art world. So that's another like two different identities almost. He had to like juggle. And at the same time, he described himself as a social chameleon because he, he was very aware mm. that he fit into all these different worlds. Mm -hmm. And he had to find a, an artistic language to express that. So often when we see these figures and we see that they look like matchstick men because they have very simplified expressions, they're actually masks. Mm -hmm. And then you understand why you think, ah, that that makes sense, actually. And um, he's a very fascinating artist. He shows uh, not only or what I what I was looking at, and I only looked at him for a very short time, but he had these very um, ex expressionless uh, figures. And then he also had figures that had a lot of expression in them. Mm. So he was sometimes he would show his inner angst or his you know his his inner frustrations or his inner his inner feelings of 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 what he was feeling but he had these two different ways right so sometimes he was showing the masks mm. and sometimes he was showing what was underneath the masks yeah and he was very interested like the way that you described that really reminded me of him a scholar called michael howard who talks about ellis lowry and um ellis lowry was a big reader of philosophy he was like really really well read mm. people again don't think this they just think he was like a you know a, a man from manchester who wandered the streets but he was fascinated by the philosopher francois de la roche foucault and he's a 17th century french philosopher mm -hmm. and um la roche foucault used to go to the french salons and he'd he'd spend a lot of time like listening to people's what people had to say and in salons people would test out their thoughts they'd also read poetry that they liked and people would respond so you know someone might say a line in a poem and everyone would go yeah and then he'd know he'd perceive and he'd know 
why it was so good because mm-hmm. he'd, he'd be very perceptive on how people reacted. Um, so La Rochefoucauld got this really good understanding of human nature, the difference between how people present themselves in the world and actually their interior reality. And in the like the frontispiece to his book, as Michael Howard describes, um, La Rochefoucauld includes an illustration of someone taking off a dramatic mask. So you can see the mask in the hand and also the actual human face behind that. Mm-hmm. And Lowry's continuously expressing that in his work. And um, Lowry actually said during his, um, Lowry actually said that every portrait, every painting he created mm-hmm. was actually a portrait of himself. Mm-hmm. So he was very aware of this um, this conflict. Ah, thank you, I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> he was very aware of this conflict and actually in his later works, he produced self-portraits that were just pillars in a sea. Mm-hmm. And they were actually called self-portrait, but it'd be mm-hmm. a very pillars abstract ca- canvas with yeah. just a pillar in the sea, mm-hmm. which is just fascinating. Have a drink of water. Yeah. <laughs> I get very excited about Lowry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see why I, I looked at his work and uh, I could look more at his as his work. So, thank you for bringing him to my attention. Uh, you should visit Manchester and go to the Lowry Gallery. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, you never know where we'll end up next. Let's see. Do I have any other questions? Perfect. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to ask you why you decided to study art history. Mm. So when I was growing up, I didn't, I, I wouldn't say I came from a particularly academic household. Like my dad studied history at university, but he's an accountant. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, my mum, my mum didn't, you know, she, so we didn't, we didn't really have like a lots of, I don't know, I, we didn't have like a family tradition of being in like the art world or mm-hmm. people studying art history. Anybody in your grandparents or anything like that? Were they artistic? A, yeah, a few a few people have been artists. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of people who study art history are from backgrounds where art history is almost like, you know, in the family. Like I didn't know it was actually a subject for me to study, for example, mm-hmm. at, at university. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like I did, just didn't know it was an option. I'd mm-hmm. never heard of the Courtauld Institute, which is where I went on to do my master's, which is like the you know, the place to study art history. Um, and I didn't know anyone in the auction houses. So it was like a world that I felt very disconnected from. Mm-hmm. But I was really lucky because my parents used to take me to to, to art galleries, to, to Manchester Art Gallery, which was like my, you know, the closest one to me. And they'd take me to St. Ives in Cornwall, which is like a, was an artist colony where mm-hmm. Barbara Hepworth. Oh yeah, is that right? Yeah. I took you there. Oh wow, that's they, very lovely. And I remember actually when I was, my parents always laugh about this because it just seems like such a weird thing for a child to say. But when I was very, very young, like probably about eight years old, mm-hmm. we were all walking on the beach in St. Ives and we walked past the Tate St. Ives. And I was like to my parents, I'm going to direct that when I'm older. Oh, <laughs> isn't <laughs> um, that something? Yeah. So who knows whether that will happen. But I I had this feeling within me that I, I loved art but mm-hmm. I just never thought about studying again it sounds stupid now especially given that I said that at age eight but I just didn't know it was an option I'd never really studied images but then during my undergrad at Cambridge when I studied history I started to actually incorporate images into my arguments mm. and then I thought wait a second this is a really interesting way to formulate an argument and a way to see the world it wasn't just my enjoyment of going to galleries and looking at the artworks on the wall, but it was actually using art as a lens to see the world and enhancing how I saw the world in that way. So that's why I decided to study a master's in it. And also just a passion, I think, to share art because I feel very lucky that I grew up, like I said, with my parents taking me to art mm-hmm. galleries. And I know a lot of people don't have that opportunity. And that's why I feel so passionate about bringing art history to schools and teaching people how to look at images and that these images are for them. So when I see these artworks, which are quite disconnected from how we experience the world when they've got very, very long words, it really frustrates me. Cause I'm thinking like for a lot of children who are brought up without art in their lives, if they then decide when they're older to go to a gallery and they see these really abstract theories, mm-hmm. of course they're not gonna think that art's for them. Like why would you, if you're just gonna be lectured at and told that you don't understand. Mm-hmm. So that's what motivates me especially to go into public arts I think and um and try and think about these ways that we can weave art history into into more schools 
Well, I know these these little plaques that are beside the paintings. Mm. I rarely even read them anymore. Oh yeah, good good choice. Because they seem they seem so politically motivated that I'd rather just look at the art piece. Yeah, because you don't get much leisure time, right? Like people work so much, and like if you're then going to say in my leisure time I'm going to go to the gallery, you don't really want to be lectured to. No, <laughs> so that's right. It makes sense. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Oh, thank you. I've really enjoyed speaking to you. It's been fun. Yeah. Now we'll go for a bike ride. <laughs> <laughs> From one thing to another. Yeah. From one creative thing to another. Yeah.